Chamber of Commerce, City Council Forum. My name is Mike Graves. I'm the public defender for the 5th Judicial Circuit, and most importantly, have been a resident of Tiberias for the last 15 years. Uh, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm a little bit nervous, because I'm used to talking to 6 or 12 people at a time, and not this kind of group. But there's a couple things we want to make clear as we begin tonight. Number one is the city, uh, or excuse me, the Chamber of Commerce has endorsed no candidates. The purpose of tonight's forum is to allow a civil discourse that gives the citizens of Tiberias the opportunity to make the most educated and informed uh, vote in, in the coming weeks because we are talking about a civil discourse we're going to ask everybody to be respectful to everyone in the room and each of the candidates because it's only through that respect that we can hear each of the candidates and make the most informed decision when we enter the voting booth the questions for tonight and the rules will be as follows. Each candidate will be given an opportunity to make a two-minute opening statement. We're going to go in alphabetical order. There will be time for six to eight questions because we have to be out of here by eight o'clock. Uh, hey, I didn't rent the room. Uh, each candidate will have an opportunity to answer that question for one minute. When the timekeeper says stop, they can finish their sentence. Not a run-on sentence, but a sentence. Because at the end of each of, when all the questions are done, each candidate will be given a minute and a half for a closing statement. And they can use that closing statement however they so desire but they can also finish answering or finish answering any of the questions they feel like they wanted to go forward and get more information on. We also encourage you that if your questions are not asked or you don't think had the opportunity to be fully answered, please talk to the candidates. This is an important election for a city that we love and we just want the candidates to have the opportunity to get their positions to the voters and the voters to make the decisions in a most enlightened and educated fashion possible. The questions were written by folks as they came in. The selection of the questions has been through four or five people, including myself, that we believe most represent the questions that have been given. Uh, so I guess if there's any problem with the questions that are asked, talk to somebody in the back of the room. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm a lawyer. I never take the blame for anything. <laughs> I would like to introduce our candidates, and what we will do 
is we will go alphabetically for the purpose of making the opening statements, asking the questions, but we will rotate the questions so that each one of the candidates has the opportunity to answer the question first and then go forward. So there's going to be, with only one microphone, some microphone passing going on. Please be patient with us. I would like to thank the Tavares Chamber of Commerce for giving us this opportunity. Very much like to thank the candidates, all of them, for coming here tonight so that we can hear them, and all of them for putting themselves forward in the elective process. So alphabetically, though it's not necessarily seated that way, we have Walter Price and Troy Singer, the candidates, to fill seat number four. For seat number two, starting on the far end, David Boylston, Lou Bleakis, James Sweezy, and Robert Wolf. We will first start with seat number four, and Walter Price. You have two minutes to give your opening statement, sir. Mr. Price? Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. An informed voter is the best voter, and so you uh, should be able to uh, be more clear on your selections uh, after the forum tonight. Uh, I'll briefly tell you about myself. I've lived in Tavares for 39 years. I've raised my family here and now grandchildren here. I have three Bachelor of Science degrees. They're in real estate, risk management, and marketing. I'm an Eagle Scout. Very proud of that. I'm a 32nd degree Mason. By trade, I'm a real estate appraiser. And I've been doing real estate appraising in Lake and Sumter County for 35 years now. Seen a lot of changes from orange groves to rooftops in that time. Uh, back when the city of Tavares had a CRA committee for the downtown redevelopment, I was the chairman of that committee. I've also served as the president of the Appraisal Institute, which is the professional side for appraisers in the state of Florida. Also, some of my stances on issues, I'm fiscally conservative, I'm independently minded, pro-life, pro-Second Amendment. Some of the reasons I'd like for you to consider me tonight are I'm very independently minded, I'm not a rubber stamper. My uh, experience as an appraiser and real estate broker uh, would be invaluable for planning and zoning issues as well as all the developments that come along that uh, we need to talk about in depth. And I really want to try to rein in some of this spending that the city's doing. I think the spending and the debt in the city of Tavares is out of control. So, uh, you know, they say a million here and a million there, and soon you're talking about real money. Thank you very much. Our next candidate for seat number four, Mr. Troy Singer. Good evening, everyone. Yes, my name is Troy Singer, and I've been married for the past 21 years to my beautiful wife, Kelly Singer. We have a 16-year-old son that's a junior at Tavares High School. This community has given me so much over the past 40 years, and it has truly been my honor to give back to this city by serving the city of Tavares. For the past three years, I've had the privilege of being a council member, a position that I do not take lightly. During my first time on during my time on council, our city tax rate has decreased without sacrificing our high level of services. I have made sure that our infrastructure is taken care of. I have worked to increase our reserves and to protect our environment. I make sure our city staff is supported as they bring in billions of dollars in grant money to our city that further reduces the tax rate and the tax burden on our residences. I also work to keep our small town feel by being involved with our community 
and making sure that the city has good partnerships with all of those in our community. I'm extremely proud to say that this year, our city council was able to decrease our city tax rate by one of the largest decreases in the county. All of this has drawn a record number of new business to our city. These things show that Tiberius has been doing great things, and I want to continue moving Tiberius forward. Over the past three plus years, I have gained valuable knowledge about how government works. I have fostered many partnerships within our community by being involved. I'm proud that I have kept our tax rates low, been fiscally responsible, and gotten things done. I'm fortunate that I have been and will continue to be a full-time city council member. Anyone can say what they will do or want to do. I have proven I'm accessible, involved, professional, conservative, and an advocate for Tiberius. If you want a proven leader, a person who loves your community, then you will vote for me November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. And now, the candidates for seat number two, beginning on the far end, with Mr. David Boylston. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is David Boylston, and I moved here 10 years ago. I was born and raised in Lake County. Um, and I moved uh, to Orlando for 10 years, so you can imagine why I came back. Uh, you know how amazing the city is. And uh, I work at Ruby Street Grill downtown, um, and we see a lot of different people who come through visiting or weddings. We see a lot of weddings since the new pavilion. And when people come through, a lot of times they tell me what's so impressive about the area. It's not so much how beautiful it is or how amazing the buildings are. It's all about the people and what they do to perpetuate this amazing atmosphere. And I think that the more that we can uh, get the general public uh, their money back uh, so that they can enjoy the things that they have already spent money on, like their beautiful parks and uh, all the resources that we offer them, that uh, I think that that will make everything better. And having community involvement uh, is very, very important. Um, uh, also, uh, I believe that um, when we're looking at um, how to spend money, we need to look at it like we're spending money for ourselves. And we need to make sure that we're doing what people uh, need and not what they want, or what we think they want, which is even worse. Um, so uh, that's all I got. Um, looking forward to some of your questions. Again, candidate for seat number two, Ms. Lou Wiggis. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. It's nice to see this room full of people wanting to see what it's all about um, and not taking the elections lightly. Um, as Mr. Graves said, my name is Lou Buigas, and years ago, during tough economic times, this city afforded me the opportunity to open a business. From that day on, Tavares has been home. Giving back to my community has become a priority, and that has led me to run for city council. Um, wanting, um, as a result, my strong business foundation, community, and civic leadership will be an asset to the city. Wanting what's best for Tavares is what unites us. My determination, tenacity, and work ethic set me apart from the other candidates. On a personal level, I am married to my very patient husband for 37 years. We have an adult daughter, three grandchildren, two of which attend Tavares High School. My husband and I share our home in downtown Tavares with our 15-year-old Dachshund, and we call Tavares home, of course, in, in downtown Tavares. Uh, professionally, I am a state of Florida licensed building contractor, and I, spe I specialize in doing custom homes, remodels, and additions. I am not a developer. Um, as well as, I'm very involved in the community. I serve in different boards and um, in enjoy being a part of the city. I hope to have your vote on November 5th. Thank you. I'm turning over my microphone to the candidates, so if you can't hear me, A, it's probably not that important, and number two, just raise your hand and let me know. Next is candidate for seat number two, James Sweezy. Good evening, and thank you, thank you for being here. I appreciate it, as do all of my colleagues up here. I came from Michigan. I've been here 15 years. I came kicking and screaming. I came down to take care of my mother. I fell in love with this place. 
and soon came to realize why my family actually settled here 50 years ago, 50 plus years ago. And my grandparents, aunt and uncle, cousins, out of all of us, everybody on my dad's side of the family, we've all ended up in Tiberias. I love what Tiberias gives to all of us, and I want to continue doing that. I'd love to continue to find ways to lower our village rate, keep our taxes down, just have some moderate growth, but have growth. Commercial growth ain't all bad, neither is residential. Let's do what we can, work together. And as Kirby Smith reminded us yesterday, it's about reserves and about roads. And I'd like to also add it's about maintaining our infrastructure. Let's work together and make it happen. Thank you. Short, sweet, to the point. And the final candidate for seat number two, Mr. Robert Wolf. I too would like to thank everybody for coming out tonight and getting a chance to meet the candidates and listen to what we have to say. Uh, I was born in Orlando, moved up here at eight years old, been here for 42 years, except for time when, after I graduated high school from here in Tiberias, I went off and joined the Marine Corps, after which I came back to the city of Tiberias, uh, met and married uh, my wife at the time. We were married 24 years. I have a 23-year-old son right now who just finished up college up in Iowa, which I'm very proud of. Uh, in 1997, I started my own business, which I still run today, a small tile company, which I'm very proud to do, and uh, I love doing the work for the around here. Uh, 06, I decided to run for city council, and I won. I was lucky enough to be on the city council for eight years. During the hard economic times, I, with the staff and the other council members, pushed for an impact fee exemption. Well, we ended up exempting $1.8 million worth of impact fees, which reoccurred $50 million of new construction throughout the city of Tavares. It helped open a lot of businesses, be it medical, be it uh, dementia center, Osprey Lodge, hotels, uh, restaurants that are all still working today. It supplied a lot of people in hard economic, a lot of people in hard economic times with jobs. And in turn, it's built a city, and the city has grown from it. And I'm proud to be part of that. I want to get back on council and try to help do more of the same. I want to see the infrastructure uh, tightened up throughout the rest of the city instead of downtown. The city did a lot of that already. I'd like to see the roads throughout the uh, outside neighborhoods and subdivisions taken care of. And also, I'd like to see Wooten Park fixed and also Woodley Field for the kids get taken care of. Thank you. The first, uh oh. The first, never mind. The first question from the audience, and I'd ask the candidates to pay attention. If you ask me when it's your turn to repeat the question, I will. But as you'll see, it takes a little time for the question. And we'll start alphabetically with seat number two, Mr. Boylston. The question is, my 87-year-old mother's average water bill is over $100 each month. Her electric bill in July was only $99. Water bill is $119. <coughs> How is it possible rates are so high? What, if anything, do you propose to reduce these rates. Excuse me, the candidates will have 60 seconds to answer these questions. Um, your rate is so high because they did a whole bunch of infrastructure and rebuilding um, in the downtown area, which made it so that there's no way that we can have some sort of flint situation here. So we're already ahead of the ball uh, as far as all the cities of our comparable size, at least, if not every city in the state of Florida. Um, being ahead in this uh, is a great decision for the city, and I'm proud that they did it because we're paying more now for our water bill, but also uh, we won't have to worry about that in the future. Um, also, there are some fees that are incorporated into our water bill. They're not incorporated into other cities' billing in the same way, so it could be uh, misleading. Ms. Fleegan. That's a 
that's a question that's often asked of us. It's definitely a sore subject with a lot of our residents. Um, I live in the city, and there is a base fee for the water. The base fee is in the neighborhood of $80, $85. So regardless whether you use the water or not, you're still going to incur a fee. Um, whether you go away and you're a snowbird, you're still going to have a flat fee on there. So it's not a usage, it's a flat fee. And that does not, you're going to have that. Um, as far as what's going to be done about it, again, as a new council member, there's all sorts of things that we need to explore and see what's there. Just because it's been happening for many years doesn't mean we can't um, look at it and review it. Thank you. Mr. Sweet. I agree with a lot of what Ms. Borges just said. It's time to review our water bill, see what we can do to lower our rates. I agree that they're high, but I also like that two trash pick up a week, and I like some of the amenities that we've got. And as in a lot of other cities, we have a lot boiled into our water bill that they don't. In terms of the electric bill, that's a utilities commission question that I don't think any of us could really answer. Mr. Wolf. Yes, this water bill is actually the utility bill and it covers water, sewage, garbage, stormwater fee, fire assessment fee. So it's just more than just the water bill. But yes, it is somewhat high, but that's the number throughout years that the rate study has showed that the city needs to charge for the base rate. Like I said, so that base rate, like Ms. Boyd said, is around the 85 to $88 and such. Um, one of the things people don't realize, you get you know, bulk pickup on the, your garbage. You can take your garbage to the dump for free. So those are other things that people don't might not know or just overlook. It is something we can look into in the future and see if we can cut down a little bit. But as of right now, I don't really see it coming down. And that's the reason why, because the things have to be maintained, be it the water wastewater plant and the water utility, uh, water plant. Thank you. Seat number four, Mr. Price. As I've been campaigning around the city, that's been one of the dominant issues is the utility rates. And the city just had a rate study done. Tiberias is third out of the 14 cities in rates for utilities. If the other 11 cities below us can provide water cheaper, maybe we need to go and find out how they're able to do it. And if you think the bill's high now, this rate study suggested, and they implemented, a 3% increase next year and a 3.5% increase the year after that. So just hold on to your seats because it's going up. And as far as the base fee, do you know the residents of Aries have to pay that base fee of $85 even if they're snowbirds and they're not here using water? You can turn off your cable, you can turn off your newspaper, I think you should be able to shut off your water bill as well. So, and as far as, you know, there are some things people could do. Okay. Mr. Singer. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think the uh, majority of the candidates hit the nail on the head. Uh, the city of Tavares, uh, I think we've all mentioned that we want to make sure that we take care of our infrastructure. It's extremely important. The rate study that has been done, it tells us exactly what we need to charge in order to keep our infrastructure up. And, uh, you know, we just had that recent rate study done. And the, uh, the original rate study that was done about five years ago suggested that the, uh, the increase was, uh, was more. Now, right now, uh, the city council just recently, we, uh, we adopted a new rate study, which is actually a lower increase than uh, what was previously uh, brought before council. So we were able to reduce that more, or by more than uh, what was originally brought forward. But uh, like I said, that's to make sure that we take care of our infrastructure. Yeah, there might be other cities that have a little bit lower rate, but you don't know what their infrastructure is like. They might be paying more in the future uh, to take care of their infrastructure. Thank you. The next question, we will begin with the candidates for seat, seat number four. And that question is, Candidates, why do we have a 6.9 millage rate when towns around us 
are at 3.5. We will begin in seat number four with Mr. Singer. You have one minute. Yeah, there's many variables that go into uh, the village and what the uh, you know what the city offer. Um, I mean, I can't speak to what the other cities offer for their uh, you know three point whatever millage. I can only speak to the city of Tavares. Uh, if you look around at what we offer, I think uh, the city of Tavares we're doing some great things and the services that we provide, and we are a uh, you know taking care of our infrastructure. And you know we're doing doing a lot of great things in the city of Tavares, and uh, like I said, we were able to lower that millage uh, rate from last year. So that's something that I'm very proud of. Mr. Price. Well, I'm glad you brought up that 6.9 percent millage rate. Um, you guys were saying that you've lowered the taxes because you've lowered the discount of the millage rate 2%. But in reality, property values went up 10%. So in essence, you did a tax increase on this this year. Now if you have homestead property, it's not going to affect you too bad. But the very businesses they're trying to bring in here, multifamily and commercial, they're going to pay the full increase. So I'm very frustrated when they say, oh, we've lowered the millage rate more than anybody else, which actually they didn't. To, uh, Howie and the Hills lowered theirs the most. Um, so I don't know. If they want to lower the taxes, they need to start the rollback rate and go down from there. Well, please pass the microphone to Ms. Buikas, the candidates for seat number two. Why do we have a 6.9 millage rate, millage rate, when towns around are 3.5? Ms. Buigas. Well, for starters, 15 years ago, the millage rate in the city of Tavares was 7.0, with less, with less um, citizens in the city. Um, you get what you pay for at the end of the day. And in order to have the services we have, as such as police, fire, and the upgrades that we have uh, throughout our infrastructure, it, have, it has to be paid from somewhere. So where is it going to come from? Unfortunately, from, from that. Thank you. Mr. Sweezy. I think when it comes to millage rate, you need to look at your population and then look at what we have. I like what we have. I don't necessarily like the millage rate. I think there's ways we can lower it. And yes, there are cities that have lower millage rates and they don't have the services that we have. We need to think about that. Short and sweet and to the point. Mr. Wolf. Yes, uh, one of the reasons the millage rate is higher in the city of Tavares than it is in a lot of other cities. Honestly, the city of Tavares is the county seat. So, the county courthouse is here, the jail, the Lake County School Board. They take up, there's about $300 million worth of properties that pay no taxes to the city of Tavares and take up very nice properties along 441 and also downtown Tavares. So if we could tax them, I guarantee that would offset the millage, but we can't. So that has to be taken into consideration. And just until recently, a couple years ago, the city of Tavares had to respond all the time to the county courthouse, to the jail, with the fire department. So the city had to pay that bill. Recently, we worked a deal, a lot of the city did, that the county would finally start paying back. But until then, the city taxpayers wanted a hook for taking care of county buildings downtown and throughout the city, which was unfair to the residents of Tavares. That's time. Mr. Boylston. Uh, I don't have much to add. They pretty much covered it all, except for that I'd like to see a sliding scale uh, for property value and for the millage rate, so that it equals out. Thank you.
Thank you. If you'll pass the microphone to Mr. Sweezy, the next question will begin in seat number two. Should the Tavares City Council have a role in the growth of small business in downtown? And if so, what will you do to grow small business in downtown Tavares? I think the city has a responsibility to promote growth of business in Tavares. And I would be very active and willing to help assist in bringing new businesses to our town. That helps to lower our tax rate, helps to work at lowering our, lowering the tax rate at our, our roads, our reserves, our infrastructure. It gives us monies to work with. And it could work to lowering the millage rate. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. The city has an economic development coordinator who reaches out for small businesses and businesses in general to come to Tavares, either downtown or out on the highway or wherever. Um, so as for given any incentives or anything like that, I'd be hard pressed to do that because giving something to one group and not the other, obviously it's not right. With that said, if we can work with the school board more, the schools get upgraded to an A or B level school, that helps out when outside businesses try to come to Tavares because they ask those questions. And we need to work together with the school board and with our economic development coordinator to see how we can help bring an outside company into the city of Tavares. Pass it all the way down that way, Mr. Boylston. Um, I found that uh, a lot of the time when the city council or whoever is in charge thinks that they're helping, sometimes it doesn't end up being that way. Uh, for instance, uh, I work at Ruby Street, like I said earlier, and the train is a lot of traffic that comes in and out of our little businesses. But one of the biggest problems with the train, and you can ask anyone who owns a business down there or who has uh, a lunch spot, that they come in, they have 15 minutes to eat and leave, and it's nearly impossible for anyone to meet that demand at that speed, uh, and so they end up being unhappy. And, this, and then the City gets to take credit for traffic increase, but really it's a negative increase because we are we have people leaving unhappy. I think we have to be careful about what we are incentivizing, where we're putting people, how long they're going to be there, and what it's going to do to the people there. Thank you. Ms. Buigas. Could you repeat that question, please? Do you believe that the city government, the city council, has a role in growing small business in downtown? If so, what will you do to grow small business in downtown Tavares? Well, I think the city has an obligation to do economic development for the city, but not only in downtown. It needs to do it in the seven square miles that is Tavares, not only in downtown. Um, and currently the city actually has an incentive for a brewery, and that request is out there. If there's a brewery, they will get a certain tax break and impact fee waiver, if they come into Tavares, but it should be for the entire city, not only for downtown. Thank you. I thank you very much. I think we come to Mr. Price in seat number four. Well, as Robbie was alluding to earlier, there's a lot of government and religious buildings in downtown Tavares, and there's not a lot of places to put any retail businesses down here. There's just no buildings. Uh, so building buildings like that as a private uh, business, it has, the city doesn't have any reason to do that. Now if they could offer some incentives, temporary tax incentives or something to help bring some people down, that might be fine. But I think that the retail businesses are going to be on Highway 441 and Highway 19 and they're not going to be so much downtown which is why they're event-oriented. They can bring people down to Wooten Park and uh, Tavares Square and uh, get people down here uh, to patronize our restaurants and bars and stuff that we have down here. But, um, you know, I don't like the government getting involved in private enterprise. Mr. Singer. 
if you look at the growth in the downtown area over the past 10 years, I think you can see how much uh, has really been added. Uh, we have three hotels. Uh, we have quite a few restaurants and bars in our downtown area. And I think all that has been attributed to the economic development that we have going on in our city. And that's true. Um, you know, we have a lot more going on than just the downtown area. We have a number of um, new businesses in our industrial park. Look at our uh, medical plaza across from the hospital. Look at the new expansion of the hospital. There is so much growth going on in Tiberias. It's not just the downtown area. And I believe in partnerships. I think the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce is doing a wonderful job bringing business in to the entire Tiberias area, not just the downtown. So I don't think we concentrate solely on the downtown. I think we concentrate on Tiberias as a whole. Thank you, and we'll start with seat number four for the next question. Mr. Singer, beginning with you. Was the pavilion a worthy or worthwhile investment for the city of Tavares? And is the pavilion paying for itself? Mr. Singer. The pavilion was um, a project that was uh, taken on before I came on council. Uh, I've been on council for about three years now. I do know that when the pavilion was built, I don't think it was built to be profitable. It was built to be an economic driver. You look at all the businesses that have come to the downtown area since the pavilion has been built. Um, I, I know right now that no, the pavilion is not profitable. Right now it's being paid for by the taxpayers. But you can also look at all the, uh, the businesses that have come to the downtown area because of the pavilion. But like I said, the pavilion was put in before I was on council, so I can't take credit for it, and I can't take responsibility for it. Mr. Price. Well, the pavilion is running in the red to the tune of approximately $214,000 a year at the moment. So, plus it also has bonds that are still being paid on that as well. Uh, that was not a good investment. If we're going to make investments, they should at least have a return on investment. But if you've ever looked at the rates to rent the pavilion, if you want to rent the pavilion for your wedding on a Friday night or a Saturday night, you're talking four to $5,000 just to rent the pavilion, which I don't think most Tiberias residents can afford. Now, they may have people coming from out of town, but then you've also got to use the caterers that they have on, on a list. You can't bring your own caterers either. So the whole venture turns out to be too expensive for most people. And That's time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Price. We will begin with Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Actually, I was on council when all that took place. We had a lot of meetings with citizens to see if they were, how the pavilion was to go along. Was it just going to be a fishing pier to resemble the 1912 pier that was built? So he took a gamble, per se, hoping that in six to eight years that the return on investment would actually get it paying for itself. Obviously that hasn't happened yet. But it, like Troy said, it has been an economic driver and it has brought a lot of business to downtown and it's filled up hotels, and it helps other businesses, and it brings people to downtown, just not for the pavilion, but to see what else that the city can offer. So yes, I would glad to see it hopefully break even soon, but as of right now, it is not, and I understand that, but sometimes the risk reward does not pay off, but I still feel proud that we've built that pavilion out there on the lake, because it has done a lot of good for the city. Pass it over, please, Mr. Boylston. Uh, not to bring up Ruby Street again, but uh, it's right next to the pavilion. And uh, we get big wedding parties at 12 o'clock at night after they're done there, and they come over and they eat with us and they drink with us. And it represents a lot of money every day. Um, and I know that we appreciate it there. Um, and uh, it keeps us open late. Uh, we're the only place you can get dinner past 11, I think, in the entire city. 
So um, it's nice that we have that random boom of 50 people walking in, you know, ready to drink and eat and have fun. And they always end up like loving to Mary's and wanting to move here and talking about how they're going to come back. So uh, I understand that it's not operating um, uh, to profit yet, but I believe it will in the future. And I also believe it's kind of booked for a while. And in a, on an unrelated note, related note, uh, I went to a wedding in Orlando, and the cheapest place there to get uh, a spot to get married is a ski ball place, and it's about 2.5 grand. So I don't know, it seems a little bit better. Ski ball? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't very nice. This <laughs> point is. Well, the pavilion, there, nothing will give you a return on your investment in five years. The pavilion is, the pavilion is five years old, and return on investments take a while. The pavilion is a showcase, and it was built uh, on a foundation of the original Civic Center that was out there. So basically, the mission of the city is to, to um, honor the historical value that the city was built on. Therefore, that's why that pavilion was done. The pavilion complements the hotels and the entertainment district. Um, it is pricey. It is a very nice place. And they do have rules because they want to maintain it a certain place. The calendar for the pavilion is 18 months um, it's scheduled 18 months in advance. So hopefully by year seven, the pavilion will pay for itself. Thank you. Mr. Sweezy. I think that the pavilion was a good investment. Even you know, though it's still in the process of paying for itself, it's going to be that way for a long time, but it does drive economically our city. When you look at the people in the hotels, they are patronizing our establishments downtown. They are bringing money into our community. That helps our tax base. So is, is it worth it? If it's bringing money into our revenue, into our cities and our businesses? Absolutely. I believe we start the next question with Mr. Boylston. Candidate in seat number two. Let me see if I can cut a few words out of this one. Florida Hospital Waterman is an asset to the city, but it also requires the use of many resources from the city of Tavares. If elected, would you be in favor of legislating or negotiating terms that would require the hospital to be cost neutral with the city. Um, I I would say yes. Uh, I think we should always be trying to renegotiate contracts uh, that are in our favor and are in our taxpayers' favor. Um, one of one of the most important things, and one of the reasons I'm running in general, is to make sure that uh, the people in Tavares are not priced out of Tavares. Uh, so it's really important to me to try to lower taxes, lower the village rate, um, and make sure that people here can stay here, because I think that's what makes this place special. Thank you. Advent Health. Uh, they were christened a new name, I believe, last year. Um, is a huge employer for the city of Tavares, for the residents. It's great to have it right on 441 in our city. Whatever we can partner with them and do with them, we need to do. Um, it's only in our best interest. Thank you. I would agree that Edmund Health Waterman has been a great asset to this community. And I've watched it grow in the time I've been here. I think we need to work with them as much as we can to be cost neutral. And, but the influence and the impact that they've had on our community is a definite plus in the, the amount of employees that they have that, again, puts revenue into our pockets. Thank you. Yes, uh, years ago the city approached, at that time, Florida Hospital Water to see if they would be willing to pay like their fire assessment fee, which they deemed they didn't have to. By law, they don't. Well, I do think they need to start paying something back to the city of Tiberias because the city of Tiberias taxpayers also pay county taxes. The county offsets Advent Health's uh, 
operating costs of about four to six million dollars a year out of the general fund from the county. So that's the city of Tiberias taxpayers' money. So I, yes, I think they can come back and pay the fire assessment for the advent help. And that would help, you know, the city residents out instead of getting tagged twice on taxes for the hospital. And for seat number four, we begin with Mr. Price. Well, I don't know if you know it or not, but the hospital, they don't pay sales taxes. They don't pay property taxes. So I would say that any situation where we can lower costs to the city of Tiberias regarding the hospital, we need to do. Mr. Sink. Yeah, I'm always in favor of negotiating anything that we can do to uh, you know, alleviate some of the pressure on our citizens' uh, tax base. I think uh, you know, that's something we can definitely look at. Advent Health is a very uh, good community partner. Um, I know that they uh, do a lot with the chamber. They do a lot for their community. And I know that you know, by having them here, it truly is an asset. I mean, just imagine if they weren't here. Uh, we wouldn't have as many people visiting the area. We wouldn't have uh, you know, them patronizing the restaurants. Wouldn't have uh, you know, them moving into the homes that are close to the hospital. So uh, I think it's a, it's a great asset to, to have Advent Health in our community. Thank you, and let's pass it down to Ms. Buigas. We'll start this question. And please tell me if you don't understand the question because this is in part a question from the audience with a little bit added on by me. <laughs> I'm a construction worker. Speak, speak slowly. I get paid by the word. Uh, the question is, what would you change about Tavares? And I would add this. Fast forward 10 years from now, the year 2000. 29. Describe the city of Tavares as you like would like to see it. What can you do or the city council do to make it happen? And what changes would be required to get there? Well, I actually love it just the way it is, and that's why we make it home. But in answer to your question, the, the quality of life is very important to continue having that and to preserve that, to have that 10 years from now, 20 years from now as well. The one thing I feel personally we are lacking are options in places to live. We've got new industry in town, new businesses, employees at the hospital, that it would be nice if they lived in the city of Tavares. And we don't have those options. We have very few apartment buildings that for folks to rent, and we've got to have those options available for them. Thank you, Mr. Sweet. I'm pretty comfortable with the way the city is today. I'd like to see some added development downtown, some new businesses, and maybe some downtown type of living. But I'd also like to see some partnerships from outside the community, bringing them into our focus as well. Going forward, I'd like to see some of our communities redeveloped, enhanced. A lot of our bubble home communities need upgrading, but we also need to do in our future, find ways to look out for our seniors and our kids as well. And what kind of legacy are we going to leave them 10 years down the road? That's what I would think about. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. Yes, I would like to see the city keeps still small town feel, but you know, I would like to see like to the east on Alfred Street, a lot of that get developed in some way, cleaned up a lot, because it's a pigsty going out that way towards Mount Door, I think. But you know, that's mostly county properties. Get that cleaned up, get a nice apartment complex, come in, help like loose it. People that get a job at the hospital also like to see 19 get a facelift because coming in, you have the old industrial park, you have something to do with that. You know, you're talking 10 years down the road, like to see the city look a lot nicer throughout, not just downtown, but as every um, entrance into the city, come from the east, south, west, north, whatever, and just be a more vibrant community downtown and the subdivisions and such prosper and look nicer with the infrastructure and such. 
Mr. Singer. I love the city of Tavares. I love where we're at right now. I love the city of Tavares when I first moved in the area some 40 years ago. You know, when uh, I think when we were here back then, I'm wanting to say maybe we had 5,000 residents. And, uh, you know, it always seems like people are always so afraid of what the future holds. But it seems like the city of Tavares has always had that small town feel. I think we still have that small town feel. And I think one of the ways that we continue to keep that small town feel is by staying engaged with our community. And uh, I think we've done a really good job of that. One thing I would like to see is uh, a little bit more industrial in our industrial park. Because the one great thing about having uh, industrial companies is they uh, they take the, a lot less um, away from the citizens and they pay you know the same amount of tax, so uh, it's it's less of a strain on the uh, utilities in that. So uh, that would help with uh, you know lowering our tax base. Hey, Walter, hang on to the microphone. You're going to be up on this one. Let me make up the question first. Um, no, I got one. Go ahead. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. Sir. Heck, I, I forgot the question I asked. Twenty well, years from now. I'm I think we need a Popeyes and a Carabas for starters. Uh, Amen. Really? Uh, I think Tavares needs to stay the family-friendly small town that it is. I'd like to see us concentrate efforts in the whole city, not just the downtown area. Get our roads fixed, get the west end and the east end cleaned up, and just uh, you know, not go crazy. We need to pay off some of the $73 million in debt the city has right now, which I think is excessive for 17,000 people. And so um, mainly keeping it small town feel, family friendly. Thank you, sir. You said I was that. Hang on, I've got to come up with the next question. There were a, a couple of questions with regard to growth. The one that I think best talks about growth in general from one of our citizens is as follows The city has recently approved a large number of housing projects that have been very controversial controversial, two of which have caused lawsuits. Do you think the city's process for reviewing development is about right, or does it need change? That's with the second question, which I believe goes together, how do you plan to control growth in Tavares? Mr. Price. Well, I think that the process does need to be looked at. Uh, I've heard that they've not followed their own rules and regulations in these developments. And I think as an appraiser, before the city approves a new development, that there should be some kind of demand feasibility study to see that there's actually a need for it. The uh, development they approved out in Shirley Shores, I know that developer's history and it's not good. Uh, the prices he wanted were ridiculous, and they need to take a harder look at some of that kind of stuff before they uh, approve it. I, I think we also need more commercial growth in the city because our property taxes are lopsided. The residential taxes are paying more than their fair share, and a lot of the other cities have more commercial, and we need to bring some more commercial in here. Mr. Singer. No, I don't think the process needs to be changed. I think it's been working fine. Um, everybody always talks about growth. When we're growing, people want us to stop building. And then when uh, there's no growth, people want us to build. So right now, I think we're in a, in a good spot. Um, you know, the developments that we have going on, it just shows that people love the city of Tavares. People want to move to the city of Tavares. You all here, I'm assuming that you all love the city of Tavares. That's why you moved here. I don't think we should disallow other people from having as much joy coming into our city as we have right now. Same question beginning with 
Mr. Sweezy. I do think the process needs to be reviewed and the way we approach development maybe needs to be tweaked a little bit. Maybe we need to do more research on whatever. I know I had a development coming into my neighborhood proposed for like 350 apartment units, which got scaled back to 260, and now it's zoned for 25 homes. Because the traffic people didn't look at this, the road, the traffic. It's a lane and a half road. I think we need to evaluate that. We need to reassess our process. And going forward, I think we'll have better growth, more, our growth will be limited, but it'll be quality, and that's what we want. Mr. Wolf. Yeah, right now, the, I think the city attorney's land regulations are, are pretty, you know, pretty good right now. Sure, there could be tweaked a little bit here and there, and that's what they're actually doing right now, putting together another 20-year comp plan for future growth and how they're going to come into the city of Tavares. The different subdivisions have come and gone. Some of them have been declined or changed their minds. And have I had opposition from <coughs> opposing neighbors that don't want to see the change even though it fits what the city of Tavares land regs would allow. So that's where some of the issues have come up. Uh, as Walter said, I would also like to see more commercial growth come in. And 13 years ago, it was about a 15% uh, commercial, 85% residential on a tax base. I think it's closer to 60, 40 or something like that right about now because the city did bring in a lot of commercial properties to help offset the tax rate. And hopefully over time, you know, within the next few years, more and more commercial properties will come in and help offset the residents' tax rate. Mr. Bolston? Um, I believe it's incredibly important to make sure that we uh, are not putting things where they don't belong and make sure that they fit in where they're going and make sure that the people around in the surrounding area are okay with them being there. Because I don't think it's any, it's not in the city's best interest to put things where people don't want them, and they certainly shouldn't be putting them where the neighbors are going to be extremely upset. I think it's really important to make sure that our notices are out and that we continue to do everything in our power to uh, make sure that we communicate why we're building it and not just that we're building it. Thank you. This is. Well, actually, our tax roll is 67% residential and. 35% commercial. So increasing that commercial percentage would be excellent. Now I happen to serve on planning and zoning, so I'm kind of familiar with the, you know, the base of that question. You know, there's a little saying in planning and zoning, it's called NIMBY, not in my backyard. And you know, we buy a piece of property, there's vacant land, well somebody owns that land and they own it because they're going to make a return on their investment. So we have to make sure that when we buy something, if it's up for grabs, that and something else can be built there, that we're aware of that. Um, that is such a loaded question that that would take about five minutes to really answer it properly. Um, and the city did not approach any of those developments in asking them to annex into the city. It was requested by the uh, person purchasing the property. And the last question of the evening, which should be relatively short before we get, go into our final statements. And I believe we'll start this one with Mr. Wolf. If you were elected to the city council in your first meeting, please name the top priority you wish the council to address. Rhodes. <laughs> Mr. Wolf. Lighting up our suburbs so that we have uh, actual, like, you can walk somewhere and feel safe in the city. Uh, that's my top priority. Ms. Boykins. I do feel safe in the city. Um, water bill. Utilities and roads. And we'll come down and start with Mr. Singer in seat number four. Infrastructure. And Mr. Price. 
Roads is definitely important. In fact, in this year's budget, the city of Tavares has allocated $185,000 for Christmas lights, but only $225,000 to fix the roads. And they had a, a little surplus of $16,000, and they asked the public works director how much road could he repair for $16,000. He said not even a block. So they need to allocate more resources to roads. And, um, of course, my top priority is trying to get some of the $73 million in debt paid down uh, in the spending. For instance, they want to build restrooms out at the uh, cemetery. They've allocated $200,000 to build restrooms at the cemetery. Even if you built a 200 square foot restroom, you're talking $1,000 a square foot. Anybody that knows anything about real estate knows that $1,000 a square foot, you know, maybe on Park Avenue in Central Park. That's time. <laughs> simple follow-up question will go in the same order and hopefully have the same brevity of answers. Candidates, and I believe we started with Mr. Wolf, you've named your top priority. How do we pay for it? Mr. Wolf. You take the money that's in the existing budget and you make it a priority. And that way, instead of spending it on something that you want, you spend it on something you need. And roads are something that is needed in the city of Tavares throughout the different subdivisions and neighborhoods that have been neglected since the early 80s. Mr. Wolf. Can you repeat your priority with your answer, please? The priority for Mr. Wolf was I can read roads. Um, we can always uh, look for uh, money in the budget because uh, uh, for, uh, well, mine is uh, lights. Um, I'm not sure how much uh, exactly it would cost per uh, light uh, in the entire city, uh, but in, in the outskirts. But um, when we're talking about safety, I think that when we're looking at um, purchasing something, we should try to find something that does two things at once, or at least. Uh, lights provide safety and are also welcoming for economic growth. Uh, not to steal from Tom Bodette, but we'll leave the light on for you. It's a saying for a reason. So uh, I find that a city is lit, it's way more inviting. Uh, thank you. Ms. Bleakis. And I had said um, water bill, and that would basically be to go through all the studies that have recently been done and see how that can be addressed. And if there is any way of addressing the issue with um, having the snowbirds not have to pay a water bill when they're not in town. Mr. Sweezy. I said roads and utilities. I think our roads need to work. Utilities, it is, we're covering everything from water to garbage pickup to everything in your water bill to assess it, to see what we can do to roll it back, and how would it fund it through the budget. Let's look at how we can reduce our budget to cover all of those things. They're important to me. I don't know exactly the best way to describe the way I feel about it, but anything we can do to reduce our budget, I'm for it. Yeah, so my answer was infrastructure, because one of the most important things to our citizens is the infrastructure and making sure that that's taken care of for generations to come. And as I mentioned before about the, the water bill, I mean, that's taking care of the utilities for that. Um, so that's why we have the rate consultants tell us what we need to charge on our rate bill or on our water so we can take care of that infrastructure. And yes, roads is a very important thing. Our city council was able to increase our road resurfacing by 30% this year. And my priority next year is to increase it by at least another 50%. We are fortunate that we do have a, a staff that goes after grants. So my, uh, my thing is I want to make sure that we go after all those grants that we could possibly get. And that's one of the ways that we're able to 
handled some of the road resurfacing that we've handled in the past. So yeah, we do have a certain amount of money that we've spent on road resurfacing that's in the general budget, but we also have a lot of funding that comes from grants. So I would make sure that we continue pursuing grants. Mr. Price. Well, the last thing I would want to do is to raise taxes and fees on the citizens of Tiberias. I think that we need to look at the budget items uh, because the things that are in that budget, the costs are just so unbelievable, like the $200,000 for a restroom or $650,000 to replace Wooten Wonderland in the park. I think we need to take a look at costs, but um, definitely spending cuts in, would be where I would look at in grants because grants, that's money that we've already spent, folks. The government's already taken it from us. We might as well get, get it back as much as we can. Thank you. Just before we move into the final statements, which will be 90 seconds, I'd like to once again thank the Chamber for hosting this event. Number two, I would like to thank the candidates and their families. As an elected official, the public defender is elected and having run in five different counties for this, I know what a commitment it is to put yourself forward for election and what a commitment each one of these candidates' families has made to do so. So we thank them because we are only as good as the quality of candidates that we have to choose from. And finally, and finally tonight demonstrates one thing. When I first moved to Lake County in 1984 and started in what is now the, the county building, which used to be the courthouse, uh, and I'm still one of the new kids on the block, I used to say my fav favorite thing about the city of Tavares was sitting on a Friday night out on Main Street when the wind's blowing just right and hearing the band play at halftime of the high school football game downtown. It's ultimate small town America. But I'm going to tell you tonight, demonstrate what, what really has made me fall in love with the city as the ultimate part of the county that I love. And it's you all that are sitting here interested in the future of our city, the manner in which you have comported yourselves, the seriousness of your questions, and the seriousness in the manner in which you take your votes. You all deserve to give yourselves a round of applause. You're why I love the city of Tavares. So we'll begin alphabetically, beginning with Mr. Boylston. You have 90 seconds to wrap up your position. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I'm running be, uh, for the most part because I want to make sure that everyone in here uh, is a little bit happier than when they were right now in, in two years. So um, I think that it's really important to make sure that we do what you guys want us to do, but also what you need us to do. And I know I've said that before, but it's really important to me that we don't go around just building random things and improving everything we can and that we stay within our means. Um, uh, I don't know what else to say because I love the city so much. I'm so excited for the future. And one of the best parts of this entire process is I've got to meet all the people running the city and uh, how unbelievably well they're, they're doing it. And um, it's really exciting to go and talk to these people. And they're available and you can always go reach out to these people. They'll email you back. They'll talk to you. And they'll tell you everything more than you want to know. And it's amazing. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to be in this process. And I hope to earn your vote by November 5th. Thank you. I'd like to check, uh, thank the Chamber and the Board of Directors of the Chamber. I know it's not easy to put these events together. Mr. Graves, of course, your time. It's always nice to have you be moderator at any event. Um, my agenda is preserve the quality of life, tough oversight on city projects, hold government accountable, fiscal responsibility, and responsible growth. I hope to have your vote on November 5th. And I also would like to mention that I am not going to let special interest 
groups define what conservative is. I have been a Republican for over 40 years, and I have spent my life fighting for lower taxes and opportunities for all. Thank you. And I thank the Chamber for sponsoring this evening, and I thank everybody for being here. As we move forward, I hope to see the city be part of stabilizing our growth, enhancing our waterfront, maintaining it. I'm looking forward to the day when we get our boat slips back and running, and I know it's around the corner, but I feel good about what's happening. I feel good about where we're going, and I feel good about how we're getting there. Let's just all get together, work together. I promise to be accessible, very accessible. Let's make it all happen. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you to Terry's Chamber also. I'd like to say thank you for all y'all showing up tonight. And Mike Craig, of course, glad to have you here. Like I said in the past, I grew up here, graduated high school here, came back, started a business. My son graduated high school here. I have a lot of roots here in town. I love this city. I was fortunate enough to serve on the city council for eight plus years, and during that time, the city had a great growth, a lot of prosperous things went on, and I was glad to be part of that. That's why I want to get back on council and make sure that the city keeps moving forward. We lost a great councilman as he resigned from, or finished his term, Mr. Smith. So I'd like to fill his shoes and keep moving forward the city of Tiberias to make sure we have common sense growth, fiscal responsibility, and making sure that the city moves forward in a positive manner. I would again like to thank everyone for coming out tonight and the Chamber of Commerce for sponsoring this event and our moderator, Mike. On November 5th, you have the choice between continued out of control spending and debt or start reining that in with fiscal conservative leadership. You have the choice to elect someone that cares about the whole city, not just the downtown. You have the choice to elect someone that is highly concerned about the actual costs for city expenditures. You have the choice to elect someone that doesn't automatically rubber stamp everything the city staff wants. It's not the Sears Christmas catalog. So I just want you to remember the future of Tiberias depends on your vote. Thank you. Like the other candidates, I do want to thank the chamber. I want to thank all the residents for being out here. Mr. Graves, wonderful job. As I said before in my opening statement, I love the city of Tiberias. I love where we're at. I think everybody that I seem to talk to, everybody seems to be very happy with where the city of Tiberias is. Seems like the only people that are upset are the ones that are on social media, and I try to ignore those people. But I'm very happy with where the city of Tiberias is. I want to keep us on the same track that we're on. I want to keep us moving forward. I don't want the negativity. Everywhere I go, I advocate for the city of Tiberias. I think the city of Tiberias is probably one of the best cities in the entire state of Florida. And I want to keep that going. I want to keep serving the citizens that I love, the community that's done so much for me. All the decisions that I make sitting on that Tiberi City Council, I listen to both sides of, this, of uh, the issue. I do my research. I listen to the residents. And I make a decision that's best for the entire community, not just a select few. There's 17,000 plus residents in the city of Tiberias, and every decision that I make is for the majority of those, and I hope I can count on your vote November 5th. Thank you very much. Thank you, and as we come to an end tonight again, thank you for being here. I know you're going to vote. You're here. Our job is to make sure that our neighbors vote. That's how a city runs. That's how democracy works. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you to the candidates. Travel safely tonight. Thank you.